On the morning of February the 22nd, 2006, news broke of the biggest cash robbery in British history. Forget the great train robbery, forget the Northern Bank in Belfast. Britain's biggest ever robbery took place in the early hours of this morning in Kent. It was a crime like no other. Hunting for the clues to hunt down the robbers. The search is on for the armed gang. A raid on a cash depot during which robbers made off with an incredible £53 million. Then held staff hostage before loading up a lorry with cages and even shopping trolleys full of banknotes. For the police, the key questions remain. Who are they? Where are they? And what will they do next? We're gaining valuable forensic evidence. We're developing intelligence on a range of suspects at the moment. The morale on the investigation team remains very high, and I remain confident that we will both catch and convict the people responsible for this. They had pulled off an audacious crime, but would the armed gang have the cunning to avoid capture and enjoy the spoils of Britain's biggest ever heist? The Great Train Robbery in 1963 is, for many, the most famous heist in British history. Robbers made off with £2.6 million in used banknotes from the Glasgow to London Royal Mail train. That's the equivalent of around £40 million today. But in February 2006, their record was beaten when an armed gang escaped from a security depot with £53 million packed into the back of a lorry. They disappeared into the night with half a tonne of cash, most in 10 and 20 pound notes. Each member of the gang had become an instant multi-millionaire. But for how long? Police worked round the clock to track down the men responsible and get the money back. Everything's moving very, very fast, so we've got a number of teams doing different lines of inquiry, and that's all got to be herded in like a shepherd bringing his flock, you know, what have you got, what have you got, what have you got? More than six months before the robbery, the gang had chosen their target, this anonymous-looking warehouse in Kent known as Medway House. The Securitas cash depot was used to sort and circulate cash around the country for the Bank of England, money used to service cash points and shops. But it was a fortress, apparently impregnable. The compound was surrounded by CCTV cameras and high steel fences. And it was situated within a triangle of three 24-hour police stations. Pulling off the biggest cash heist in British history was never going to be easy. It would take months of meticulous planning and just one night to execute. First, the gang was assembled. Transport, weapons, disguises needed to be sourced, money laundering and escape routes planned. But most of all, they needed to find a way to evade the massive security at this cash depot. They fixed on this man, manager Colin Dixon. Married with a child, he'd been with Securitas for four years. He was the man in the know, the one who could get them inside the building. They decided upon a tiger kidnapping, which is a, a trusted formula in, in, with bank robbers, whereby you kidnap uh, an executive, a senior worker in the bank or the cash depot. You hold him hostage, you also hold his family hostage, and then you make him help you under duress. Colin Dixon has never given an interview before. He is asked to remain anonymous because he still fears for his safety and that of his family. Tuesday, February the 21st, 2006, had been a normal day at work for Colin Dixon. At around 5.30 p.m. after he finished his shift, he began the drive home to his family in Hearn Bay, 50 miles away. During the journey, Colin noticed what appeared to be a police car with flashing lights directly behind him. He pulled over. A man in police uniform approached his car. 
He told me to uh, switch off the engine, leave the keys in the car, and started opening my door and asked me to go to the police car, which was immediately behind. The bogus cops claimed he had been speeding and said they were driving him to the local police station. Instead, they drove deep into the Kent countryside. Colin Dixon suspected the worst. We pulled into a, a country lane, and it was there that the, the driver said, well, you'll realise now that we're not police officers. Just do as you're told, and won't, you won't get hurt. At this time, the handcuffs were really making my wrists sore. And I was moving my, moving my wrist to try and get them comfortable. And the person next to me, there was quite a few expletives, um, and pulled a, a handgun, a pistol out of his um, waistband and said, this is a nine millimeter, this is to show we're not mucking about. He seemed to be getting very agitated. What I didn't want is for him to think I was doing something to try and I don't know, escape or, or whatever, and the, the gun to go off. Um, I said just now I was scared. Seeing a gun that close was, it was, it was very frightening. Later, he was told to get out of the car and was bundled into a white van. I was blindfolded, uh, my legs were tied together, I was still handcuffed. Um, I'd got no idea what was going on. Well, I'd got a good idea what was going on, I suppose, that uh, a robbery was going to happen and I was going to have to be part of it. I was also thinking, OK, at home, Lynn would be starting to wonder um, where I am. Um, and there was no way I could contact her. What Colin didn't know was that while this was going on, robbers disguised as police had called at his family home. They told Lynn Dixon that Colin had been in a car crash and they could take her to the hospital to visit him. Scooping up her child, she got into the car with the men. Once in the vehicle, the robbers threatened to shoot her and her child if they didn't cooperate. They took her to the van where Colin was being held. The gang and their hostages were now at a farm in the Kent countryside. Colin Dixon was interrogated at gunpoint about the security at the depot. I was moved to the edge of the van, so I was sitting by the, on, by the sliding door with my feet out. And uh, my wife came over to me and asked if I was OK. Um, there wasn't much I could say other than, yes, are you OK? And that was it, virtually. They, they took her away again and moved me back into the van. And I think the, uh, the, the thing there was, we're, we're proving to you that we've got your family, so just do as you're told. With a gun pointing at his wife and child, Colin Dixon knew the choice he had. Let the gang in the depot, or risk being killed, alongside his family. Under the cover of darkness, robbers disguised as policemen had kidnapped Colin Dixon, the manager of one of Britain's biggest cash depots. They were also holding his wife and child at gunpoint and they were about to try to pull off the biggest cash heist in British history. As we got close to the centre, and uh, I really could feel my heart beating, pumping at that time, thinking, OK, what happens if things go right? What happens if things go wrong? If things go wrong, I don't know where my family are. If things go right, I still don't know where my family are, but if I could trust these people, bearing in mind that uh, were criminals, obviously, and they'd got my family away from me. What would happen? Would they keep to their word and, and release them? Almost eight hours after he'd left work, Colin was back at the depot. 
With a gun in his back, he approached the entry control room. So I said to the, the guy in, in the control room, look, they've got my family, just do as we're told. Um, and the gun was brandished and uh, he was tied up. I then forced to, to let in the, um, the car and the other robbers into, into the building. From there, it was very alarming, frightening. I wanted my staff to be safe. I wanted my staff to not do anything silly that could put my family at risk. Because at that time, I knew the car that we were in had arrived. My family could be anywhere. I just didn't know. Seven gang members armed to the teeth were now inside the depot. Meanwhile, the 14 staff were getting on with work as normal. Shift manager Alan Thomas was at his desk. His colleague Michael Lawton Zimmerman was sorting notes. Came in about, about one o'clock in the morning. Colin came in with what I suspect or what I thought were three policemen. Um, he, he, he walked in through the doors. Um, he, he looked at me and he said, oh, I'm sorry, Alan. I, said, I thought perhaps that they'd had somebody under surveillance, perhaps somebody had been stealing money and they'd had them under surveillance and they'd come in to arrest them. So I thought he was saying sorry because he was going to leave me short-staffed. Um, but then the lead policeman well, pulled a gun out and stuck it into my face and shouted, you know, get down, get down. You, get up, get down. I managed to catch sight of the person who was behind him and noticed that he had a, a shotgun and he was also wearing a mask, like a paintball mask. And um, then I realised that they weren't policemen and you know, I better com <laughs> comply with what they were saying. You must get up from the floor. Down, down. Hands back. Where I was standing, there was a little partition uh, barrier, so I couldn't actually lie down where I was. So I had to walk around towards him um, ah. and lay on the floor. And he proceeded to cable tie my hands together. And as he done that, the rest of them went into the room where the rest of the staff were. Work. I heard someone shouting, turn round and looked, and there was a man standing in a boiler suit, mask, hood over his, over his head, and obviously, and an automatic weapon in his hands. And he asked me to come to the centre of the room, which is what I did. I was aware of Colin Dixon to my left, and he said, don't do anything, they've got my wife. And I started to say, Look, do as you're told, please, they've got my family, but before I could get too many words out, there were two of the robbers standing right behind me, um, shouting, screaming, I suppose, waving their guns about. They're all on the floor, the policemen are swearing, shouting, effing and blinding, guns, cable ties are produced, their hands are tied very tightly. And I remember looking at my staff and thinking, well, God, what have I done? And at that time, I, I really didn't know what I'd done. Well, I knew what I'd done, but what the consequences were going to be. One elderly man, his wristwatch is broken by the, the force that's been tied up with these cable ties. They're all soon in, in severe discomfort. They're very, very scared. Uh, they're manhandled, shoved about uh, this depot. I was forced to, to let in um, the lorry into one of the loading bays. At that time, I had no idea at all that my family were in the back of that lorry. Knew who, to, who were there because they were asking, well, who is so and so? So that to me indicated that not only had they got an insider, but they knew exactly who was going to be in the building at that time. All the staff were forced, and I was then forced to lay on the